Hi, I'm Steve, and I host the History of the Papacy podcast and Beyond the Big Screen. I love Ryan's History of Ancient Greece podcast because he discusses more than just a straight-line narrative of ancient Greece history. He explores culture, history, institutions, politics. That is what I'm attempting with the history of the papacy. I want to explore the back alleys and side streets of the popes of Roman Christianity that aren't normally covered in the official tour. And beyond the big screen, I interview podcasters, bloggers, and more, like Ryan, about the real story, history, and context behind your favorite movies. If you want to learn more about my shows, you can go over to the website a2zhistorypage.com to learn more. Thanks and enjoy the history of ancient Greece. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 61, The Two Goddesses. Demeter was one of the five children of Rhea, whom Cronus had swallowed. She was freed by her youngest brother Zeus, with the help of Metis, and the emetic drug, but she did not play a major role in the battle with the Titans. She does, though, appear on Greek vases, holding a golden sword or a spear and fighting in the battle against the giants. Even so, Demeter did not distinguish herself in the various early clashes of the gods in the way that Athena did. She was much more concerned with the fertility of the earth. Her origins as a grain goddess probably began sometime in the Neolithic period with the advent of agriculture. On Linear B tablets, she is referred to as Sitopatinia, or Mistress of the Grain. The name of Demeter has in it the obvious root meter, indicating plainly that she is a mother, but the other syllable, D, is not as clear. Perhaps it comes from the same root as the name of Gaia, so that she is to be understood as the Earth Mother. But there is another similar Indo-European root that means barley, which fits well with the central theme that barley plays in her cult, and the fact that she is the one who promotes the growth of grains and taught the arts of agriculture. Regardless, because of her role as a fertility goddess, Demeter is considered to be one of the earliest deities in the Greek pantheon, although Homer rarely mentions her in his epics, and never places her on Mount Olympus. She is typically represented with wheat stalks in her hand, because she is the goddess of grain, and thus the residual life force in the germ of the wheat that makes the stalks grow. As the giver of grain, she is called Ceto, or she of the grain. Her Roman equivalent is Ceres. She is also often shown holding a torch, because along with her daughter Persephone, she is worshipped through a mystery religion. Persephone herself was born from a union between Demeter and Zeus. The details of how this came about, though, are scarce. Their relationship probably occurred before he married his other sister Hera. Anyways, Zeus was dazed by the beauty of golden-haired Demeter, and so he fell in love with her. In Homer's Iliad, Zeus claims that Demeter was one of his most memorable lovers. He see it quite plainly says in his Theogony, quote, Zeus came to the bed of all-nourishing Demeter, and she gave birth to white-armed Persephone, whom Hades carried off from her mother. But why Zeus gave her to him? End quote. The union of the weather god Zeus and the goddess responsible for agriculture is natural enough and does not need elaboration, as Zeus's affairs with various divinities brought about gifts to mankind and contributions to the natural order of the universe. What does stand out from Hesiod's passage, though, is the part about the abduction of Persephone at the hands of Hades, which comprises the defining myth of Demeter. Most of our information on Demeter and her cult comes from the Homeric hymn to Demeter, in which the poet describes in great detail the story of Demeter and the abduction of Persephone by Hades. He had been given control of the underworld when he and his brothers, Zeus and Poseidon, drew lots after their defeat of the Titans. Well, when Persephone came to the age of ripeness, she was wooed by several of the gods, including Hermes and Apollo, but Demeter rejected all of their gifts and hid her daughter away from the company of the Olympian gods. Hades, though, was also interested in the beautiful Persephone, and so he approached his brother Zeus for permission to make her his bride. 
Zeus thought this was a great idea, but he knew that both Demeter and Persephone would never consent to her entering the realm of the dead to become queen, so they contrived a plan, where Hades would take his bride by force. The plan was set into action one day while Persephone was with Artemis, Athena, and some of the daughters of Oceanus, gathering flowers. It's significant that these were all virgin goddesses, because these types of flower-gathering festivals were usually held by girls who were about to be married. Well, Persephone noticed a Narcissus flower, which was an ancient aphrodisiac, in a luminal place on the edge of the meadow. As she wandered away from the group, at the moment that she plucked the flower, a terrible thing happened. The earth opened up and out came Hades, riding in his golden chariot, which was drawn by his four black horses. He grabbed her and as she let out a shriek, she started to struggle against him. But in the end, she was unable to resist the king of the underworld as he dragged her down below the earth to his abode. As the earth closed back up, Persephone became an unwilling bride to the very personification of death. Similarly, Hades became the death of her virginity, and so the flower is the symbol of the death of a maiden, much as it still is today when we say that a woman is deflowered. The Homeric hymn speaks of the plains of Nyssa, but the location is vague, and various local traditions place Persephone's abduction in different locations. The Sicilians, among whom her worship was probably introduced by Corinthian and Megarian colonists, believe that Hades found her in the meadows near Mount Etna, and that a well arose on the spot where he descended with her into the lower world. The Cretans thought that their own island had been the scene of the rape, and the Eleusinians mentioned the Nysian plain in Boeotia, and said that Persephone had descended with Hades into the lower world at the entrance of the western Oceanus. Later accounts place the rape in Attica, either near Athens or near Eleusis. Regardless, before Persephone was abducted by Hades, a shepherd named Eumolpus and a swineherd named Eubolius saw a girl in a black chariot that was driven by an invisible driver, as Hades was wearing his cloak. She was being carried off into the earth, which had violently opened up. Eubolius was feeding his pigs at the opening to the underworld when Persephone was abducted by Hades, and his swine were swallowed by the earth along with her. And so the myth is an etiology for the relation of pigs with the ancient rites in the Thesmophoria and at Eleusis, which we will talk about in more detail next episode. Anyways, only two others knew what just happened, those being Helios, the sun god who sees everything, and Hecate. She is a moon goddess, similar to Artemis, but she represents the dark side of the moon, and she hangs out in the underworld at times. And so she is also associated with black magic and death, as the moon wanes and dies every month. Persephone's mother, Demeter, had only faintly heard her voice echoing from the mountains. The hymn describes Demeter's reaction like this, quote, Then, bitter sorrow seized her heart, and she tore the veil on her ambrosial hair with her own hands. Over her shoulder she threw a somber cloak, and flew like a bird over land and sea, seeking here and seeking there, end quote. For nine days she roamed the earth, carrying a torch in her hand, as she looked for her daughter. On the tenth day, she finally consulted Hecate, who admitted that she had heard Persephone's cry, but did not know who took her. So together the two goddesses went to consult Helios, to find out what the all-seeing sun god had seen. His response to them was this, quote, No other god is guilty but Zeus himself, who awarded your daughter to his brother Hades, so that he might call her his flowering bride, end quote. Hecate and Helios provide a clue to the meaning of the Demeter story. When Demeter looks to Hecate, who symbolizes death, to find her daughter, Hecate says that Persephone is not there, meaning she's not dead, but instead she's with Helios, who represents the sun rising and thus life. So Hecate is saying that Persephone is in life. In essence, Persephone had to die for life to go on. But death is not the final part of the story of this myth, which represents the Greek belief that it was not the final part of existence. The torch that Demeter and Persephone each carry represents light in the dark of the underworld, or life in the darkness of death. The news that Zeus had given their daughter away to Hades to be his bride overwhelmed Demeter. She became a sort of zombie, answering no one and showing no emotions. She shunned the other gods and withdrew from Mount Olympus. She disguised herself as an old woman and took refuge among the cities of men, as she wandered the earth aimlessly in despair over her lost daughter. By chance, she stopped near the city of Eleusis to rest at a popular watering hole called the Maiden's Well that was shaded by a large olive tree. Eleusis sits about 15 miles west of Athens, and at that time was ruled by the wise king Kelios and his queen Metanira. 
As the despondent goddess sat by the well, the two daughters of the king happened to come upon her. She was obviously depressed and wouldn't talk to them. So they took pity on the old woman, not recognizing her as a goddess, of course. They invited her to come back to the palace to become the nursemaid and caretaker for the new child of the queen, named Demophone. Demeter agreed, most likely hoping that taking care of a new child would help her ease the loss of her daughter. When they arrived, although she was still disguised as an old woman, she had found it difficult to conceal her divinity, as she loomed so large that her head nearly struck the ceiling, and a kind of divine light filled the throne room. The king and queen instantly recognized that there was something different about her, as they leapt from their thrones and immediately offered it to the old woman that the girls had found. Demeter refused, though, and for a long time she stared at the ground with the veil hanging over her face. Everything that the girls tried to do to cheer up Demeter did not work, though, until finally a servant girl named Iambe, also called Babo in other sources, intervened and tried new methods. She found a stool for Demeter to sit on and then engaged her with lewd gestures, fun-loving and body jokes, and sexual jesting to lighten the old woman's spirits. She went so far as to expose her private parts to her in a kind of vulgar way. She even gave Demeter a special drink made of water, barley, and mint called Kikion, which is essentially beer, and which was much more potent than the ancients believed. This drink eventually became part of the cult of Demeter. There will be more on this drink in the next episode. Anyways, these efforts of Iambe did the trick, and the goddess finally cracked a smile, showing that talk of sex and laughter can bring life into something that seems dead. Iambe's behavior also became part of the cult, and it is seen as apotropaic, because laughter can ward away bad feelings and thoughts and bring about a smile. She had festivals in which women threw rocks at each other to drive away the evil spirits, which are also afraid of loud noises and much energy. In the ancient world, iambic poetry, which was named after Iambe, was highly charged, abusive, and fun-loving, as we discussed in episodes 18 and 19. Finally, Demeter agreed to nurse the baby, and she grew to love him so much that she wished to make him immortal. And so every night, when the rest of the household was asleep, she took the baby to the family's hearth, smeared him with ambrosia nectar, the food of the gods, breathed on him with her divine breath, and roasted him over the fire, all in order to burn away his mortal parts, which would then be replaced with the ambrosia. It's a very lengthy process, though, and so this went on for several nights. Eventually, the queen began to suspect that something odd was taking place at night, so one night she decided to spy on the old woman. When she saw what was transpiring, at the very moment the baby was in the flames, she burst into the room and screamed, as one would expect. Demeter, though, didn't react with empathy. She threw the baby across the room and cursed at the queen, telling her that this is why mortals have to die. Because of their own foolishness, they resist the gifts of the gods. She then revealed her divine character and demanded that the Eleusinians build her a grand temple on their Acropolis. This temple would become famous throughout the ancient world. When it was complete, Demeter then withdrew into her temple and shut herself off from the world. Once again, she began to sulk and bemoan the loss of her daughter Persephone. Her sadness eventually caused the earth to become barren because crops ceased to grow any longer, bringing drought and famine into the land. Human beings everywhere began to starve, and Zeus became concerned with the very existence of mankind. So he decided to intervene, and he sent the gods to placate her. But she refused them, and always retorted to their pleading that she wanted her daughter back. Zeus thus knew that he had only one option left, so he sent Hermes down to the underworld to tell Hades that he had to give Persephone back to Demeter. He agreed, albeit begrudgingly, as he knew that the extermination of mankind would be a bad thing for him, because it meant that although there would be new souls in his realm in the short term, he would not receive any new entries in the long term. But Hades also didn't want to completely lose his wife, so before he sent her back to her mother, he tricked Persephone into eating four seeds of a pomegranate. This fruit is a blood-red color with milky white seeds, the perfect symbol for the male genitalia. The later writers Ovid and Hyginus claim six. Regardless, her consumption of these thus was a symbol of her taking in Hades' seed, meaning sexual intercourse between man and wife, and thus the two consummated the marriage, making it indissoluble. 
Persephone was now tied to the underworld forever, as the young maiden is united with death in a bond of marriage, meaning that life has married death and the two are joined. This is divine symmetry. The pomegranate also became a symbol of the cult of Demeter. Zeus thus now couldn't take her away from her husband, so he had to make a compromise. Since she ate four seeds, Persephone must spend four months of the year with her husband in the underworld, but the remaining eight she could be with her mother in the world above. When Persephone is in the underworld, Demeter would withdraw into her temple once again and begin her mourning, and the world would become cold, desolate, and barren, and wouldn't produce crops, meaning it would experience winter. As the daughter returns, however, springtime returns to the world and everything is in bloom. As spring becomes summer and the summertime wears on, Demeter begins to think of her daughter's pending departure and she would increasingly become depressed, causing fall to come and eventually the return of winter. And so this myth symbolizes the phenomenon of fruitfulness and barrenness of nature during the year. Although the hymn says that Persephone returned in the springtime, other authors state that she actually left in the spring and returned in the fall, which makes much more sense because in the Mediterranean climate, the period of barrenness was not the winter, but the dry summer, when plant life is threatened by drought. Similar vegetation and life, death, and rebirth myths, some of which were older, appear in the mythologies of the ancient Near East, including the mysteries of Isis and Osiris in Egypt, Adonis of Syria, the Persian mysteries, and the Kaberi of Phrygia. But why choose the daughter instead of the usual consort, like Addis and Adonis? Well, because this mother-daughter relationship is the perfect expression of the life cycle. The mother clings to the girl and loves her, but the mother must let her daughter go in order for life to go on. The girl has to die, be swallowed by the husband, so that new life will come as she takes in the seed. All of the symbols of the cult represent this fact, such as torches, wheat stalks, and pomegranates. The rooster is also representative, because it is the herald of a new day, but not a sexual symbol here as it is with Ganymede. Even today, there is a ritual in Greece when someone dies that guests eat a dish called kolifa, a mixture of seeds including pomegranate, nuts, and grains over the grave of the deceased. They're facing that person's death by thinking about the seed, symbolizing life. This affirms that there is life in the face of death, and that life goes on, but that death is necessary for that. That is the hope of the Demeter and Persephone myth. In the hymn, Persephone returns and is reunited with her mother near Eleusis. In another version, which can be seen on vase paintings, it was Hecate, not Hermes, who rescued Persephone, and she would later become Persephone's underworld attendant. Regardless, in repayment to the Eleusinians for their kindness to her when she wandered the earth, Demeter taught them certain mysteries about the cycle of life, known as the Eleusinian mysteries, and she also taught one of the king's children, Triptolemus, the secrets of agriculture and charged him with spreading that information throughout the whole world. Some authors treat Triptolemus and Demophone as one and the same, and others consider Triptolemus a citizen of Athens. Regardless, in this way, Eleusis, and by extension Athens, at least in the minds of its citizens, became the sources of agricultural knowledge for the world. A famous 5th century BC relief from Eleusis, which is now housed in the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, shows a young Triptolemus standing between Demeter and Persephone and receiving from Demeter the ear of grain. Triptolemus then flew across the land on a chariot drawn by dragons while Demeter and Persephone cared for him and helped him complete his mission of educating the whole of Greece in the art of agriculture. We will discuss the Eleusinian mysteries in greater detail in the next episode. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is powered by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Great Courses Plus. One of my greatest joys is learning about different people, places, and time periods. That's why I started this podcast and why I'm a big fan of The Great Courses Plus. With this video and audio streaming service, I have unlimited access to learn from award-winning professors and experts about anything that interests me. There's over 8,500 different lectures across so many different subjects, including history, science, language, and even hobbies like cooking and photography. You can watch the videos on a TV, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, or stream the audio with The Great Courses Plus app so that you can listen along as you go about your day. 
Being a Philhellene myself, I am pretty good with Greek history, but if there's one downside to specializing in a particular culture, it's how much you miss from the rest of the world. Well, thankfully, we can all turn to the Great Courses Plus series on the history of the ancient world, a global perspective. In order to take a look at world history through the lens of religion, philosophy, the visual arts, literature, and much more. And it allows us to see what's happening around the world from a macro perspective. You don't want to miss it, and I want you to experience the Great Courses Plus too. So they're giving my listeners an entire month of unlimited access to enjoy all of their lectures for free. But you need to sign up through my special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. Start your free month now. You will love it. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Greece. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. The various names of Persephone reveal her double function as a chthonic queen of the lower world and the dead, and as a vegetation goddess. Her common name as a vegetation goddess is Kor, which means maiden or girl. In art, she is invariably portrayed robed, often carrying a sheaf of grain. She may appear as a mystical divinity with a scepter and carrying a little box, but she was mostly represented in the process of being carried off by Hades. Homer had little interest in Demeter, and none in her relationship with her daughter, as Persephone only is mentioned in the context as the Bride of Hades. In the Attic dialect, her name is Feraphata. In any case, the Queen of the Dead has a non-Greek name, and therefore she must have originally been a deity separate from Demeter's daughter, Kor. Even after the two were firmly and inextricably identified, they were often paradoxically represented in cult as two distinct personalities. Eleusinian iconography and terminology, for example, juxtaposed Thea, another older and local underworld goddess, with Kor, the maiden. The Greeks avoided pronouncing or inscribing the ominous name Persephone in cult contexts, replacing it with Kor or other euphemisms, though such caution was less often exercised by the poets. Kor was commonly worshipped, along with her mother Demeter, and with the same rites. However, the worship of Demeter and her daughter was quite different in certain areas of Greece. The earliest sanctuaries of Demeter were founded in rural, remote areas, such as mountainous Arcadia. The worship of Demeter was far more prominent in Arcadia than elsewhere in the Peloponnese, and Herodotus asserts that this was because the worship of Demeter was mostly abandoned in the Peloponnese with the arrival of the Dorians, but was preserved amongst the Arcadians, whose mountainous lands were not penetrated by the invaders. Arcadia is sparsely inhabited, mostly by goat herds and hunters, but the region also encompassed fertile lowlands, where cereal crops were grown. Like so many other Arcadian cults, with their pronounced tendency towards animal-shaped gods, the worship of the two goddesses, as they were often called, in this isolated district, seems strange and primitive, as the remnant of a very early syncretism of the religious beliefs of the first Greek-speaking people who entered the region and the traditions of the indigenous population. The Arcadians worshipped Demeter in the form of a mare, who was a consort of the similarly shaped horse god Poseidon Hippias, who represented the river spirits of the underworld in equine form. In a future episode, we will discuss Poseidon and his relevance to horses in more detail. Needless to say, though, the horse was a special attribute. The Arcadians, like the Eleusinians, held in common the belief that Demeter angrily withdrew to an earthly abode and caused a crisis in the natural world because of her rage. But at Arcadia, Demeter's anger was attributed to her unwilling union with Poseidon. According to the myth, Poseidon saw Demeter and desired after her. In order to escape his lustful pursuit, she transformed herself into a mare, but he saw through the trick and forced himself on her in the form of a stallion. He made it with her, and their offspring were the divine horse Arion and a daughter, who originally had the shape of a mare too. She was the Arcadian equivalent of Kor, whose true name was revealed only to those who were initiated to her mysteries. In public, their unnameable daughter was called Desponia, which means the mistress, or the goddess. There is some confusion here, because Desponia was an epithet for several goddesses, including Artemis, Persephone, and Demeter, among others. 
In fact, the name Desponia is believed to have been attested in Linear B as Potania, which also means the mistress or the goddess. So it seems that this divine title could be the translation of a similar title of pre-Greek origin that accompanied the Aegean mother goddess, just as the title of Our Lady in Christianity is translated into several languages. Pausanias, though, spoke of Demeter as having two daughters, Kor and Desponia, with Zeus being the father of Kor and Poseidon as the father of Desponia. Pausanias made it clear that Kor is Persephone, though he wouldn't reveal Desponia's proper name. Other sources say that they are one and the same, and that the unnamed Desponia was later conflated with Kor Persephone. Whatever the case may be, though, due to her anger at this turn of events, Demeter took on the epithet Aranyes, or the Wrathful One. Demeter also had the title of Lucia, or the Washing One, because she purified herself in the river Ladon after her intercourse with Poseidon, which washed away her anger. Demeter Aranyes and Demeter Lucia thus form a complementary pair, representing angry and appeased manifestations of the goddess. Similarly, at Phigalia, a city in southwestern Arcadia, Demeter's archaic statue had the head of a horse and was housed in a cave on the rocky gorge of the river Nida, well outside of the city. Demeter had withdrawn to this cave, causing a famine until her anger had abated. She was known as Melania, or the Black One, because she dressed all in black to express her mood. Scholars generally interpret her blackness, which is a feature shared by the Aranyes, or the Furies, as a sign of her underworld nature. The statue was seated on a rock with serpents and other creatures emerging from its mane, and it held a dolphin in one hand and a dove in the other. This Demeter is a mistress of animals, and has close affinities with the Gorgon Medusa, who similarly sported snaky hair, made it with Poseidon, and gave birth to her miraculous horse, in this case Pegasus. Cora Desponia had little involvement in this cult, nor is Demeter seen primarily as a grain goddess here. Every year, though, the people set upon an altar outside the cave samples of all of the raw materials produced in their land, including grapes, honeycombs, and wool, and poured olive oil over these in an attempt to appease the disgruntled goddess. The Arcadian cults of Demeter resulted from a complex process combining the old Mycenaean goddess Aranyes, who was early on linked to Poseidon Hippias, and whose offspring was a horse, with the Panhellenic and Eleusinian Demeter, who bore a daughter. The persona of the daughter seems to have been superimposed on an older Arcadian goddess named Esponia. The two goddesses, mother and daughter, were not clearly separated, and they were closely connected with the springs and the animals. It seems that the Greek deities started as powers of nature, and then they were given other attributes. These powers of nature developed into a belief in forest and river nymphs, and in gods with human forms in the heads or tails of animals. Some of them, like Pan and the Selenoi, survived into the Classical Age. The two great Arcadian goddesses, Demeter and the unnamed Esponia, were closely related to the springs and the animals, and especially to the goddess Artemis, who was known as Patnia Theron, or the mistress of the animals, and who was the first nymph in the region. Desponia was worshipped in a sanctuary at Lycosara in western Arcadia. This is a very important site for the study of ancient mystery religions, although this cult remained regional rather than Panhellenic. Pausanias' account of the sanctuary mentions the worship of Desponia with her mother Demeter. He describes certain mysteries taking place there. Though he doesn't go into detail, they were most likely derivative of the Eleusinian rites. He also describes a platform called the Megaron, where an unusual form of sacrifice took place, also quite similar to the Megaron at Eleusis. Each participant sacrificed an animal, not only cutting its throat, but also chopping off a random limb for the goddess. Desponia clearly had a strong affinity with Artemis, who not coincidentally maintained a cultic presence in the sanctuary, where there also was a temple of Artemis Hegemon, or the leader, with a bronze image, apparently of a cate. From there, there was an entrance to the sacred enclosure of Desponia. In the portico, there was a tablet with inscriptions of the mysteries. In front of the temple, there was an altar to Demeter and another to Desponia. 
Demeter carried a torch in her right hand, and her other hand was laid upon Desponia. By the side of Demeter stood Artemis, who has also been identified with Hecate. By the image of Desponia stood Anitos, one of the Titans. The Arcadians believed that Desponia was brought up by Anitos, and that Artemis was not the daughter of Leto, but of Demeter. Beside the temple, there was the Great Hall, where the Arcadians celebrated the mysteries, and beyond it, a grove sacred to Desponia and altars of Poseidon Hippias and other gods too. Another myth mentions the relationship of Demeter and the hero Aeacion, a son of Zeus and a nymph, whose name varies between the sources. At the marriage of Cadmus and Harmonia, Aeacion was lured by Demeter away from the other revelers. They had intercourse as Demeter lay on her back in a freshly plowed field, and as Hyginus puts it, she was plowed herself three times. When they rejoined the celebration, Zeus guessed what had happened because of the mud on Demeter's backside, and out of envy, he promptly killed Aeacion with a thunderbolt. Some versions of this myth conclude with Aeacion and the agricultural hero, Triptolemus, then becoming the Gemini constellation. Anyways, with Aeacion, Demeter fathered the twin sons, named Philomelos and Plutos. Philomelos was the patron god of husbandry, tillage, plowing, and agriculture, and he was said to have invented the wagon and the plow. Plutos was the god of wealth, and in the theology of the Eleusinian mysteries, he was regarded as the divine child. He was usually portrayed in art as a child either in the arms of Ereni, the goddess of peace, as prosperity is the gift of peace, or in the arms of Tyche, the goddess of luck, who governed the fortune and prosperities of cities. Aristophanes wrote a comedic play about him, titled Plutos. In the play, Plutos is blinded by Zeus so that he would not be able to dispense his gifts of wealth without prejudice. When his sight is restored, he is then able to determine who is deserving of wealth, thus creating havoc. Pausanias is our most detailed source for the famous cult of Demeter Chthonia, or of the underworld, at the remote town of Hermione in the Argolid. Hermione was not a Dorian town, but was settled by those who the Dorians had expelled from Thessaly. This cult is unusual in its emphasis on the role of Hades, who was given the euphemistic name of Clymenos, or the renowned one. Pausanias reports that the Chthonia festival took place in the summer and began with a procession of all of the priests, magistrates, and townspeople, even the children, dressed in white and crowned with wreaths made from a local summer wildflower. They led a heifer to the sanctuary, where it was allowed to roam about until it entered the open doors of the temple. Inside, four old women arose from their ceremonial thrones and pursued the heifer until one of them cut its throat with a sickle. Three more cows were slaughtered for the goddess in the same way. The indoor sacrifice is very unusual, but can be explained as the result of the strict gender segregation practiced in the cult. The cult statue of Chthonia was so sacred that only the old women were permitted to view it, and the exclusion of men seems to have extended to the sacrificial slaughter, usually a male prerogative. Although the whole city participated in the festival, its climactic ritual acts had to take place in seclusion, away from male eyes. Opposite Chthonia's sanctuary was that of Clymenos, and the area was famed for its entrance to the underworld an opening in the earth from which Heracles was said to have emerged, leading Cerberus. Although Kor plays no role in Pausanias' description of the cult, she appears with Demeter Chthonia and Clymenos in numerous dedicatory inscriptions from Hermione, a fragmentary hymn composed by the 6th century BC poet Lassus of Hermione, confirms that the worship of the triad, Demeter, Clymenos, and Kor, was the norm by the late Archaic period. Demeter's principal sanctuary at Corinth was constructed in a series of three terraces on a steep slope of the Acro Corinth, which was about a 15 minutes walk from the city center. Though there was continuous activity on the site from the late Bronze Age, no evidence for a cult appears until a series of pins and rings deposited as offerings in the mid 8th century BC, which gives the impression of a strong female presence at the site. In the 7th century BC, a wider variety of offerings appears in the middle terrace, including bronze jewelry, miniature vases, and terracotta figurines. A small but substantial building, probably a temple, was already present in this period. 
The middle terrace, with its temple, sacrificial area, bone debris, primarily from pigs, and votive collections, served as the nucleus of the cult for its first 150 years, while the upper terrace contained a theatric area that was probably used for a mystery rite. In the 6th century BC came a major architectural development, as numerous dining rooms were constructed on the lower terrace. Ritual dining in this area was probably not new, but the Corinthians now expended considerable resources on dining facilities. Each room held from six to eight diners who reclined on stone couches. By the mid-6th century BC, the sanctuary could accommodate about 100 diners at once. The ritual menu seems to have been focused not on sacrificial meat, but on grain-based foods. One of the characteristic votive offerings at this site was the terracotta lichnon, which was used to sort the shaft from the grain. The cooking vessels are the types used for boiling and stewing, so gruel or porridge may also have been an important menu item. Finally, numerous cups in the form of cantharoi and skiffoi, mixing bowls, and amphorae show that wine was consumed with the meal. Who partook of these meals, though, is a mystery. On the one hand, elaborate dining facilities, reclining posture, and wine consumption are associated with men's symposia. Yet the abundance of women's votive offerings, the emphasis on grain-based foods, and the fact that this was a sanctuary of Demeter points towards a women's festival, such as the Thesmophoria. More on that next episode. In any case, the expansion of the dining facilities at Corinth continued through the 5th and 4th centuries BC. Eventually, more than 200 diners at once could use the rooms, which were provided with extra spaces for food preparation and washing. Judging from the scarcity of imported offerings here, the cult seems to have attracted few outsiders. In spite of their crucial role in the prosperity of the city, Demeter and Kor rarely functioned as civic gods. Exceptions, of course, were Thebes, where Demeter's sanctuary occupied prime civic space on the Cadmia, and certain cities of Sicily and Magna Graecia, where the two goddesses were dominant presence in the pantheon. In the Greek West, Kor Persephone herself was sometimes the most prominent partner of the two, and played an important role in the social construction of marriage and the rites leading to adulthood for women and men. In keeping with Kor's significance as the archetypal bride, the Western colonies focused on the part of the myth of the sacred marriage of Persephone and Hades rather than the reunion of Demeter and her daughter after the latter's abduction, which was the focus of the famous Eleusinian mysteries. The religious life of the colonists in the West developed differently from that of people in the mother cities for several reasons. First, the entire pantheon of major and minor deities could not be reproduced in a colony, as the settlers were forced to focus on a limited number of cults selected from those that they knew at home. As it happened, Demeter's cult was perfectly well suited to the fertile soils of Sicily. Secondly, Greek religious assumptions required that the local gods be recognized, preferably as Greek deities in a new guise, and their cult places respected. The native Sicans and Sickles worshipped a number of goddesses, among them Hiblea, Anya, and local water spirits, whose functions and personalities were easily assimilated to those of Demeter and Kor Persephone. In particular, the dominance of Persephone, who was often worshipped quite independently of her mother in this part of the world, may be due to this type of syncretism with local Sicilian underworld goddesses. During the late Archaic and early Classical periods, much of Sicily was ruled by tyrants of the Dinomenid family, including Gelon and Huron. The Dinomenids played an important role in the dissemination of the cults of the two goddesses, as their ancestor, Telenus, held a family priesthood of the Chthonia Thea, meaning the earth goddesses, or Demeter and Kor. When a group of those from Gela seceded, Telenus was able to win them back by displaying the sacred objects of the goddesses. In return for this service, he demanded a civic priesthood, which he passed to his descendants. The Dinomenids seem to have exported the cults of Demeter and Kor Persephone to Gela's daughter city, Acragus, and to several other cities in the hinterland. In fact, Acragus became a major center of Persephone's worship, so much so that already in the 6th century BC, Pindar, in his 12th Pythian Ode, described Acragus as the seed of Persephone. 
Its tyrant Theron is portrayed in Pindar's second Olympian ode as a believer in afterlife judgments, reincarnation, and final salvation in the Isle of the Blessed. It is very likely that Theron's convictions about the afterlife were intertwined with the cult of Persephone, who played an important role in the Bacchic Orphic mysteries that were so popular in the Greek West. By the 1st century BC, Cicero, in his second oration against Varius, remarked that all of Sicily was sacred to Demeter and Persephone. The names of Sicilian festivals, such as Anacleptaria, or the unveiling of the bride, Theogamia, or the divine marriage, and Coria, or the festival of the maiden, suggest the importance of core Persephone's cult and show that its principal focus was her marriage to Hades. At Selenus, the westernmost of the Greek Sicilian colonies, was a sanctuary of Demeter Maloforos, or the bearer of fruit. The sanctuary is actually a compound containing smaller shrines of Akate, who appropriately guards the entrance, and Zeus Malikios. Demeter's temple stood within a second inner boundary wall, emphasizing its inviolate nature. The rear of the temple was hidden under a large mound, giving the appearance that the entrance led into the earth. A water channel bisected this area, carrying water to the long platform altar facing the temple. Wherever visitors walked within the sanctuary, they were standing on carefully buried ritual deposits. Among these were numerous clay pomegranates, ideal gifts for the fruit-bearing goddess, and terracottas of standing women holding torches and piglets. The Mallow Forest Sanctuary is also famous for its many early curse tablets, inscribed on lead. As the queen of the underworld, Persephone, or Pasakratia, or the all-ruling, to use her local name, was a particularly appropriate recipient of these messages to the underworld powers. The Romans first heard of Persephone from the Doric cities of Magna Graecia, who used the dialectical variant Proserpina. The Dorian Greek colonists of Locri, on the toe of Italy, developed a distinctive pantheon, with Persephone and Aphrodite as the key deities. Demeter too was worshipped here in a typical Thesmophorion, but Persephone's role and personality overshadowed those of her mother. At the seaward end of the city was the center of Aphrodite's worship. At the other end lay the sanctuary of Persephone, both dated to the 7th century BC and the founding of the city. Here, excavators uncovered an amazing trove of terracotta plaques, or panaches, decorated in relief with ritual and mythic scenes. Difficult as they are to interpret, these give us a glimpse into the religious life of the Locrians in the 5th century BC, particularly that of the Locrian women, whose votive gifts, such as mirrors, perfume jars, dolls, and so forth, predominate in the excavated deposits. In the iconography of votive plaques at Locri, which we discussed in episode 56, her abduction and marriage to Hades served as an emblem of the marital state. Children at Locri were dedicated to Proserpina, and maidens about to be wed brought their peplos to be blessed. And so their Persephone served many of the functions in relation to female maturation, marriage, and childbirth that Artemis and Hera fulfilled for the mainland Greeks. Her union with Hades was a divine example of marriage, and it was she who received the pre-wedding sacrifices, known as protelea. She was also the protector of young children, but in the background was always the knowledge of Persephone's identity as the queen of the dead, and her role in the ultimate fate of the soul as set forth in Orphic eschatology. And so the widespread Greek analogy between marriage and death can be seen at low cry in its most complex and highly developed manifestation. The ideology of marriage had its own peculiarities at Locri, where social status and ritual privilege seem, uniquely in the Greek world, to have been transferred in matrilineal fashion. The wife, particularly in the role of the bride, seems to have held a higher status than in many other Greek cities. Furthermore, the idealized institution of marriage had an eschatological significance. Just as marriage was a symbolic death, Death was a symbolic marriage, and the blessed afterlife state was assimilated to that of marital bliss. On the next episode, we are going to discuss what was arguably the most important cult in the ancient world that involved Persephone and Demeter, that being the Eleusinian Mysteries. 
Furthermore, we are going to discuss the various other agricultural festivals that an ancient Athenian might have celebrated in honor of the two goddesses, as well as other deities. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 62, Agricultural Festivals. Thank you.